two FBI agents assigned to the same cases for different reasons. No explainable cause of death. Do you have a theory? You believe in the existence of extraterrestrials. One a skeptic, one a believer. Both trying to answer questions that were never meant to be uncovered. I think those kids have been abducted. By who? By what? Seal this up. Nobody sees or touches this. Distinguishing features indicate subject is not human. You've got to trust me. I gotta know what they're protecting. Hold it right there. Between reality and fantasy. You've got to protect me. Terror and reason. Aldo, what are they? Trust and betrayal. The X-rays and pictures. Lie the chilling secrets. Mulder, is that you? Mulder? Of the X-Files. Agent Mulder, what are his thoughts? Agent Mulder believes we are not alone. X-Files, a new dramatic series premiering Friday, September 10th on Fox. What is it? It's time to go back. Welcome. Hey there, welcome back to Generation S, this podcast about growing up in the 90s and the early 2000s. And let me put it to you this way. If the intro song to X-Files scared the ever-loving shit out of you as a seven-year-old, this podcast might be for you. I'm Dan Kemp, and today I am joined once again by my lovely wife, Beth. Hello, everybody. And this is, uh, for those keeping score, uh, Beth episode 10, 11, I don't even know. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't bother to check. Uh, but shout out to all of our uh, our Bethophiles out there. Big, uh, oh, I see what is, you did there. I don't know. I'm, come, I'm trying to come up with like name for your like group. You've groupies, right? We've That's we've fair. discovered this. That's you fair. know, people that have said that like they listen to your episodes specifically because you just bring so much you know uniqueness to the episodes. So, uh, you know, yeah, we got to shout out the uh, the Bethophiles. Well, I appreciate that. Yes, Thank you. absolutely. Hey, speaking of files, uh, very excited about this episode. This is one we've, you and I have discussed uh, behind the scenes, but also even here on the podcast in the past of like, we're going to do it. It's coming. It's coming. We finally finished watching it all. We're ready to talk about it. And today is the day, folks. We are talking all about the X-Files. Super excited. I would say probably one of the most important and influential pieces of sci-fi from the 90s. Yes. Hands down. I do definitely agree with that. Yeah, because not only was it just amazing in its own right as far as what it did with, you know, nine, excuse me, 11 seasons technically eventually, two movies, uh, just, you know, a multitude of other kind of spin-offs and novels and and, you know, video games, toys, whatever. Uh it really shaped, you know, a very specific genre of sci-fi, you know, f- to this day, I mean, yeah. I don't know what you'd call it. it. I mean, like a police, a sci-fi police procedural. Like, what would you? Well, it did it set the stage for a couple of other shows that I honestly do love as well? Um, because I guess it's like the formula or whatever that they yeah. used. Um, you know, namely Fringe, um, and Bones were two of my favorites because I, I felt like after it ended, before you know the tenth and eleventh season, it was like there was a hole. There was nothing else really. Yeah. You know, like. For example, you watch Grey's Anatomy. If that were to, I feel like there's so many other medical dramas out there. No offense, love Grey's Anatomy, but I feel like if that were to end, you know, or whatever. I mean, there's you could fill that void. But it, for me, at least, when it ended, it after its original run, especially, it was like, what, like what, what is there? You right. know, like yeah. what is there? I need that dynamic, and um, it did pave the way for that to. Um, you know, happen. Well, and another show you had mentioned just before we started recording, it, it came out a little later, so I don't know if we'd ever really talk about it here on this show, but uh, Supernatural, uh, you mentioned kind of gave you X Files vibes. Yeah, well, they did nod. That it was definitely because that came out, I guess, I think we were what? We were seniors, so 2005, I think, is when it. It was like the mid to late 2000s, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, no, but they, um, you know, definitely would have, there were very obvious nods to the X Files in that uh, yeah. series. And then they also had uh, Mitch Pileggi who played Walter Skinner. He was on there as the granddad to the boys on Supernatural. Yeah. So, so 
when you you know you mentioned kind of that X Files formula, and for lack of a better term, we'll, we'll call it that the X Files formula. What does that mean to you when you say like you're trying to find other shows to scratch that itch? What what components would a show need to have for you to get those vibes to be to be on board with it? Yeah, so I think they the the definitely the chemistry between Gillian Anderson and David Duchovny is one that is just it's hard to to yeah. match their energy with each other and then you know individually they they were perfect they were absolutely mm-hmm. perfect for the role perfect with each other um you know that is first and foremost i think just that chemistry um the fact that it wasn't i mean and we'll get into it a little more but it did have some like goofy campy stuff i'll, I'll give you that but it they tried to really like make it like it like it oh shit that could yeah there yeah. Uh, you know like <laughs> there's rumors about stuff that went down in you know Roswell New Mexico and i guess maybe the government could like they wouldn't want mass panic so maybe the you know they hid that shit like i don't know you right. know so some of it was i mean I don't know. Maybe like I, it took it I so sound seriously. crazy, but it sounds like some of the stuff I was like, well, that could be plausible. Like that's okay. Yeah. Um. So I like the fact that it wasn't just like necessarily, I mean, there were like, like I said, there were some crazy shit that was on there for sure. Like that were goofy and you know, whatever. But some of it, like, um, I think the story arc itself of like, just, you know, the government conspiracy and mm-hmm. like, that kind of stuff like the vaccines i mean hell with covid people were like freaking out about you know covid vaccines getting like you know are. microchips you know but that's what i'm saying and that was like a whole thing like people were getting according to the show and their smallpox vaccines you know that's how they were tracking them as far as like the alien replacement you know right. so it's like yeah. you're like well shit yeah you could you could inject something underneath someone's skin like that's pretty freaky and right. so i think the chemistry, um, the fact that some of it was, you know, they really, they did try to make it plausible, you know, when it wasn't a campy, funny episode. Well, and, and I think that's the best way to put it is it took itself seriously when it needed to and not seriously. Yes. At, you know, because that's the thing about the X-Files, too, is because there were some legitimately scary episodes of the X-Files, right? Yeah. There were, it, it real honestly, it kind of had every genre in it right you know all kind of like with like a a, i don't know like a coat of paint of sci-fi and and whatever but like you had horror episodes that were not even related to the main kind of plot lines yeah like monster of the week yeah Yeah, monster of the week that and i think it kind of coined that phrase monster of the week that was from the x-files or at least that's where i heard it from uh but you also had the you know the what we call the the mythology episodes Mm -hmm. which were essentially the main narrative that was driven each season and i think later seasons definitely leaned more into the mythology versus kind of the traditional monster of the Mm -hmm. week i would although i think funnily enough some of the best reviewed episodes were like that hold up to this day are the monster of the week episodes. Oh yes, definitely. You know what I mean? Because they are standalone. You don't have to watch them in order. And you know, it's just, they're, they're fun 40 minute, you know, you know, experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you also had, um, you know, you had straight comedy sometimes, right? Even in the monster of the week episodes, there were some episodes that were hilarious, like genuinely funny the entire way through really nothing scary about it. Uh, Darren Morgan, uh, so if you're listening to this and you know the X Files, you you probably know Darren Morgan. He was a uh, a writer on many episodes and in fact uh, directed several episodes as well, um, which are very well received by a lot and of fans. He also acted in a couple. Uh, I know at least one he was in mm-hmm. as like a like a, a guest character, and actually mm-hmm. it's one of my favorite episodes of the X Files. It's called Small Potatoes from season four or five. I can't remember mm-hmm. which one, but it's one of my favorite episodes. Um, but the Darren Morgan episodes are definitely like way funnier there's really nothing serious about them they're they're borderline spoof parodies of themselves which i think is great very um self-deprecating or self-aware humor i should say yeah uh you know which is just fantastic and now you're not a huge fan of the darren morgan episodes though because we've talked about so, this So okay so going looking back at them because we've recently rewatched it there were some that i I think I appreciated more for whatever reason this time than the first time. I think I was more so just like, oh, like I want to like, let's, let's move along this relationship piece. I oh, was, okay. So, and, and here's the thing that's, that's really funny that I honestly didn't really realize until recently is that there are two camps with this, like the, the quote, this was also something that was apparently came born from the X-Files is the term shipper. Yeah. Um, and so that's, 
the group of people that wanted them to be in a relationship. Meaning Mulder and Scully. Yes, Mulder, I'm sorry, Mulder yeah, yeah, and yeah. Scully. Um, and the funny thing is, is I just kind of assumed that every because it was the, like it was clear, like on the screen, you're like, you know, why wouldn't like whatever? Yeah. Um, but apparently, I just like recently learned this that there are apparently two camps, and there are the shippers, which I definitely fall into, and the people who are like adamant they like were purists. They were like they thought it was awful when they started, you know, with the whole William arc and the the baby and yeah. the, this, that, and the other. And they're like, you're ruining the show, you know? Um, and so I did not realize that there were people that were very, like, fervently against them Like, they wanted them to just together. be platonic and friends. Yes. And, yeah. and I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But I was real, like, I watched every episode. I was like, what are we doing this week? What's happening? What's happening? So I guess I think the Darren Morgan ones were always, like, Monster of the Week ones. And it didn't advance the overall conspiracy plot. So I was kind of, at first, I was like, Ugh. Yeah. But like once I know, like I knew how everything played out going, looking back on it, I guess I was like, oh, that actually was a good episode, even though it didn't move the the, story, the, main, story. the main story arc. But um, now that I know where it ends, like I can like at least appreciate yeah. and, it for what it is. And some of them are, again, genuinely just funny. Oh, yeah. No, they like, they are hilarious. And, and they're yeah, they're, they're fantastic. And so. You know, going back to, you know, we're talking about that X-Files formula as far as what worked for you, you know, you, you know, talking about other shows that tried to scratch that itch. So, like, let's let's kind of break down what it was about those other shows and, and or so, you know, from an X-Files perspective that kind of, you know, makes up that formula. So you have a duo, uh, uh, you know, two, yeah, so it's the, the male and female duo. Yep. Now, does it have to be for you? I mean, for this to work, does it have to be a male and female? It For me, because like I said, thinking back to like the ones that the shows that I liked. Yeah. Being. The top two being like fringe. Well, because when we talk about supernatural, yeah, that's two male yeah, protagonists, but, yeah. but they still have a bond. There's chemistry there, so I think it's. I mean, I in guess my it's opinion, just the relationship and how they play off of each other. Yeah, that's well, fair. and that's what I was going to say. In my opinion, it's more so the chemistry between the two leads. You know, gender. You know, aside. I mean, but if there is that romantic layer, obviously for certain people, that is certainly yeah, a driving force, but it doesn't have to be. So you've got, you know, you've got the, the the duo, right? You've got the two main protagonists that play off each other really well. You've got, you know, a world in which there's all kinds of crazy shit going on, for better, for worse, be it supernatural or, um, you know, fantastical or even... So like Bones, for example, you, that's not a, a out there show, right? That's like grounded in quote unquote reality. Yeah. I've never seen Bones. No, so. yeah. So, I mean, there was, um, I think with that one, the big thing was there was like a conspiracy arc. Yeah. to that one as well and i think that but it wasn't grounded in like sci-fi um, and whatever it was no like no it was science like a, you know they were you know a forensic like so um david boreanis was the fbi agent and then um uh it was emily deschanel right yeah emily not her sister right um so emily deschanel um and her team they were just the um the forensic team that like worked with him to give him the answers and when he got the the evidence and right. stuff. So yeah, there was nothing really overtly, you know, no. But there was, like I said, the conspiracy. One of the the interns wound up, you know, like being bad and, you yeah. know, going down a path and like all this other crazy stuff. And so so there's enough mystery and allure to in, that indicates something bigger is going on that yes. eventually would theoretically be revealed. Same thing with Fringe, right? With the you know the whole alternate realities. And yes, stuff like and that. the and the fabric, yeah the, yeah, the the fabric between the two you know universes was crumbling, and yeah, so um, and they were tasked basically with you know fixing that or right. figuring out how to prevent. Yeah, you know. so and it's interesting because. You're right, though. I just think about, like, again, shows like that. Like, wow, it either it ripped off the X Files or it took a lot of inspiration from X Files. However, you want to put it. I wouldn't say they ripped him off. No, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think, like I said, I think X Files came up with the formula. And, like, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. If you're able to come up with something, because I would not say, again, I do both Bones and um, Fringe, if I recall correctly, did there, um, they, there was a, a nod. Um, so for Bones, uh, the name of one of the episodes was The X in the File. Okay. And it was the one I think David Boreanaz, uh, not David Boreanaz, I'm sorry, David Duchovny actually directed. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he actually worked on it. And then I'm pretty sure there was like a reference to Scully um, in regards to Olivia Dunham. Um, you know, yeah. He like said that to her in Fringe, you know, like, okay, Scully or something. Right. Like, you know, and like I said, same thing with. Um, with Supernatural in the first season, I think it was the first or second episode, they, you know, 
refer to themselves as Mulder and Scully or something to that effect. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's great. Like that they basically, you know, it's a slight nod to like, thank you for, for basically paving the way for yeah this show and this, you know, genre to like really take off. Well, and, and here's the thing. Like, I don't think the X-Files innovated like the, the, the buddy, it's essentially a buddy cop show. Right. But, I because I I think of shows like Dragnet and other earlier. I guess the fact that it was more serious than yeah. Well, but like Dragnet was a serious show from like the '60s. But the whole idea that it took it in a sci-fi direction was very unique. And so, but I think it kind of perfected it to to a to the extent that it's still a trope or not a trope, but a formula that can be utilized today and and you know is utilized today in a lot of shows. Yes, you know what I mean. And so I I think I mean hats off to him for that because i think that's just fantastic so before we go any further on kind of like diving into like and and almost analyzing the show because there's a lot to talk about today this is a long time coming (laughs) we have i mean shit when did we start watching the show it was like january of this year okay so it took us almost an entire year to get through because there's like almost 200 and something episodes 200 something episodes two movies you know which we'll get to as well so we have a lot of ground to cover and and i you know from the beginning we're like we should do a show about x so we're gonna get to that but before we do i want to talk about kind of like the you know let's let's unlock some core memories for people right what were your experiences with this back in the day like how did you get you know turned on to the x-files as when you were younger yeah so i mean my dad loved it he absolutely loved it um and so i would catch it like if i you know if he had it on because it was a later at night so yeah I didn't really necessarily, I didn't watch it consistently at first. Um, were you allowed to watch it back then? Or? T- um, they didn't overtly say like, no, but they, they were like, it's going to scare you, you know, which gotcha. I mean, that's fair because there, yeah. there are some episodes that did scare the shit out of me. But yeah, I would catch it in passing if I like, you know, went to go get a quote glass of water or some, you know, some shit. Um, but I think the first time I really sat down and watched it was actually, I was 10 or 11 and um my dad was like i think it was my dad somebody yeah so i watched my first like without like sneaking to like catch it if my parents were watching right um i watched my first episode now gun to my head i I can't tell you which one it is i don't remember but i do remember being scared um of it like i was just like oh my gosh like that night i think i slept with my desk lamp on oh boy um and i don't do that uh, so yeah, that was my first, memory. like I said, I was, I was about 10 or 11 years old and I caught, um, an episode and, uh, but I was, it was scary, but yet I remember just being super intrigued by it. Couldn't look away. Yeah. Yeah. And so, cause I could have turned it off at any time. I could have walked away. I could have changed the channel. Right. Um, but I didn't, you know, and there was just something about it where I was like, well, I just, I want to see how this unfolds. Like, how do they figure out? you know, and solve this, this mystery. I, you know, I was always a big Scooby-Doo fan, you know? Sure, yeah. Um, and I think that was, you know, that's, that kind of adds to it where it was like, it is, it's like a big mystery and you're, you're just trying to solve it. Yeah. So that's what hooked me in the beginning. Okay. And so did you watch it with your dad then going forward, like every week or how did you? No, actually he had slowed down as far as watching it, interestingly enough. So I, uh, it was back in the day when we didn't have like streaming services and we were too poor for a DVR. So right. um, well, they, didn't, they didn't have DVRs back then even. Well, you but I'm VCR, saying but like, yes. but as you know, I got older and oh, stuff see, like yeah. into like high school. Cause that's, you know, it went until right. Oh, three or Oh four. It was Oh three. Yeah. It was Oh three. So, you know, uh, but anyway, so unfortunately I didn't watch it like, you know, consistently because you know, if if we weren't home on, I think it, the original slot was like Friday night at eight or whatever, right. you know, if I was out or, you know, whatever. So I did and I caught it on like FX um, in like they would do reruns, reruns. and stuff yeah. or the sci-fi channel. And it was always out of order. So half the time I was confused. I mean, honestly, this this la- this this last time that we watched it this year was the first time I've actually seen it in order. Oh, really? I have seen I had seen 99% of the episodes, but like very disjointed and dysfunctional yeah. as far as the episode yeah. order was concerned because I had to catch them as, as Well, I mean, and, and for the Monster of the Week episodes, it's totally fine, it right? It doesn't matter. Because they're but standalone yeah, the... stories, but like the, the mythology episodes, yes. if you're watching out of order, yeah, that could, I can imagine that getting incredibly confusing. Yeah. So for me... It, it, you know, I as a kid, yeah, I mean, I, I saw 
previews for it. I'm like, oh, this looks spooky. And then I, I can't, I, like you said, I can't remember the first episode that I watched. I do remember the first episode that gave me nightmares, though. <laughs> Funnily enough, it's not even a scary episode when we rewatched it. It was actually, it was a Darren Morgan episode. Um, and so uh, the first, so the first two episodes, the, 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 the two episodes that ring out most clearly in my head were uh, Humbug, which was a Darren Morgan episode. Oh, loved that one. Love it. It's a great episode a, great. about the, like the dude that's growing on the other guy's stomach and eats people. And anyway, uh, that for some reason scared me because it had that weird looking guy throughout with the tattoos all over his body. The, the, you know what I mean? The, the circus freak. Yeah. And, and the, it, and the, well, the guy that was growing on stomach, it made me think of uh, Total Recall. Oh yeah. Quad. Quad. <laughs> exactly. So as a kid, that definitely freaked me out. And then, of course, just, you know, that, that guy in the beginning of that, if, you, if you've seen the episode, you know what I'm talking about. There's a guy that's like, he's like burned, I guess, or he's got skin issues or whatever. Like, he's like a normal dude, but he's a circus performer. He's like mm-hmm. the alligator man or something like that. And then he gets like eaten in his pool. Yeah. And I think that episode put me off my swimming pool for a little bit because it was just creepy. Yeah, that's uh, fair. So that was one episode. And then the other episode that I remember like literally waking up in the middle of the night like to go cry to my parents because I was scared. Aww. It was uh, it was called Clive, excuse me, Klein Bruckman's Final Repose. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. With the psychic? Yep. And I don't know why, because, I mean, it wasn't like a super scary... I mean, it was. And there's a serial killer that killed Gypsy, you know, fortune tellers in it. And, um, like, there was, like, some weird imagery. But I don't know. There's something about it that just made me... It freaked me out. And yeah, I, I don't yeah. know what it was. Um, You know, there's... I think there's other scary... There's scary... I think probably the scariest episode for me now watching it, there's a couple. Uh, I think one is... um. Oh, I don't remember what it's called, but the one with the Fluke Man from season two. It's called Fluke Man. It's not called Fluke Man. Actually. I thought it was. No, it's not. Okay, and I'm that's sorry. why. Yeah, but, but it's the Fluke Man episode with that weird bad. giant human fluke worm hybrid thing. Just creepy, scary looking. Um, that's probably the main one. And then there's a, there's a couple other ones too. But like that, that's the one for for me. That's like the the scariest one. Uh, so that was my memories. Okay, but I didn't follow through with it. I didn't watch it. Uh, I knew the movies had come out. I knew there yeah. was, you know, all this other stuff. I just, I'd never got into it because, you know, my mom sort of was for a little bit. So I'd watch, I'd watched with her once or twice, but she didn't, you know, kind of like your dad didn't yeah, follow it through started with it. Yeah, it started to, yeah, fizzle yeah, out. Yeah, you know, so, and I never went back to it because I just, I just wasn't interested, uh, honestly, until I like met you 10 years ago and like, you know, I, we were, I were cleaning out the garage. I had moved in with you. We were cleaning out the garage to like make room for my stuff, basically. And like we found, came across like these X Files action figures here. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, what? What are you doing with the? What is this? She goes, she goes, oh, I love the X Files. And I said, really, yeah. you do? And and so you were like, yeah. I was like, no way. And so from then on, like we'd always talked about. In fact, this was you know we watched it all the way through earlier this year, but th- it wasn't our first attempt. We had attempted to do this like I don't know seven or eight years ago at this point, or. Yeah. I think so. Five or six, I'd say. I don't know. I was our kids were like super young. I mean, they're still young, but super young. And we just, I, I think I gave up part way through season three because I was like, eh, whatever, fine. And so I just, I, that was not into it. But I'm glad we finally get, did get through it because it was totally worth it, and I'm ready to rewatch it. Quite frankly, because it was yeah. just a lot of fun. Um, but I remember this was again the, 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 when it came out. It was just it was a big deal on Fox. This was like a staple show of theirs for so many years, and it was it, you know to the point where it was parodied on other Fox shows like The Simpsons, right? Yes, you know, with with that yeah. whole. But let's talk about kind of the elements of the X Files that, for me, stand the test of time, but also, especially in the earlier seasons, instantly transport you back to. The 90s, right? Because I think there's very few shows that you watch and go, oh, my God, that just looks so 90s, right? Which is apparently a phrase now, by the way. Or is this just a phrase that our kids made up? No, I think it, I don't know. Is it an actual? Okay, if you're listening to this and you've heard someone say that is <laughs> so 90s. so 90s. Yeah, anyway, The X-Files is so 90s. I mean, from a, you know, just with the, the music and the atmosphere. Yeah. Let's, uh, but let's start with, like, the fashion, right? Oh, because yeah. poor, poor Jillian Anderson. Scully, yeah. Woo! It was. Girl. I tell you what, those just, power pantsuits, damn. Well, and even before the power pantsuit, it was like the the pencil skirt with the the shoulder pad, yeah, you know, blazers. Uh, yeah. It was just, I felt so bad for because, like, like think about men's like Mulder looks the fucking same every season. He wears a suit and tie, and well, yeah, but the suit and tie changes though. I was a little, like, but it was like, but changes. man, Scully girlfriend, she went from like big old shoulder pads to yeah. You know, um, in season seven and eight, you know, got a little more 
I'd say modern with the times and <laughs> yeah no I mean and yeah I think Scully especially well but, I guess yeah I guess the the shoulder pads were it that I mean it was with the times the, they were very fashionable yes, for that that's, it, that's and, well and honestly the other thing too is I know you know because we read behind the scenes like the, she was very young for to play Scully like she was supposed to be playing someone in her like late twenties early thirties yeah and she was and only twenty four twenty four so very young mm-hmm. right and so she had to you know be presented as more mature because David Duchovny is. I don't know, five or six years older than her or something like that. Or In reality, yeah. Like yeah he's, so, I think he's eight years older than her. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. he's significantly older, so they had to be seen as peers. And so, yeah, she had to be kind of presented a little more maturely. I think, honestly, they probably made him look a little more youthful in, like, how he dressed and acted. You know, he had kind of a loose-fitting, you know, suit mm-hmm. sometimes with the, you know, the cool guy hair, you know what yes, I mean? Yes, yeah. And so, it's, yeah, the the fashion, and, and not just that, but, like, the characters they interacted with, it just, it felt so Well, 90s. and, like, when they would look up information, they used, like, the little microfiche, you know, where, like, oh, yeah. they had the thing, and it would just scroll yeah. through. And, but um, I feel like even in the first season, though, they had, like, early internet, where they would use the yeah, internet, they, but it wasn't. I do remember a lot of episodes in the beginning where it was, like... The microfiche. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they, they would, there was also a couple of episodes with like, like a projector. Like we used to have, like our teachers would do math problems. Like a slide, like like um, photo slides or whatever. Yeah. Like the thing that you could like draw on it, it would project on the, whatever the thing we ever, the thing everyone had in high school that that used to Yeah. 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 Your math teacher would like do the problems on the board with. Yeah. Exactly. Um, they had that, the giant computers, the cell phones, you know, giant cell phones, you Um, know, which honestly, that was always a plot point in the earlier episodes is like if they're stranded somewhere like if they can get unless they can get to a pay phone like they didn't really have like yeah. self but like i remember the later seasons like the, the like the reboot seasons you'd call them like seasons 11 and season excuse me season 10 and season 11 like like they couldn't you know they, they had smartphones right like how can well, and you they know? did they actually there were i think they did a good job in like highlighting that in a yeah. funny way like how times have changed right exactly and so like it, it just it really especially i'd say the first three or four seasons it, honestly, i mean i personally think i mean like would this show have even existed though if because think about it like if they had if this had happened 10 years later than it did yeah um and we had smartphones with camera like half this shit yeah motor well if motor just cured a damn fuji film or something right or back like, in the day like it was Polaroid. like just yeah. take a damn picture son i know yeah but uh uh yeah so i just think it's fun like would it have been as successful because yeah you didn't have camera phones so if you were standing there in a laboratory full of aliens and didn't happen to bring your polaroid with you and, yeah, and you, nobody believes you it's like well you yeah no you're proof. crazy you, but you now everybody do? like is taking yeah. photos and videos and <laughs> i mean we're even past that at this point people will do a video and then they're saying people saying oh that's deep faked you know so it's almost coming full circle like you can't even trust oh, that's video fair. now that's fair. you know what i mean it's which ai I, generated i feel like that would be an interesting if they ever brought the x-files back you know could, could go that route where all of a sudden yeah they're getting the video of it but no one believes them because they it, it could be yeah. it could be ai generated whatever you know what i mean so mm-hmm. um so again the fashion just the the overall the technology used mm-hmm. let, let's talk about like just the and I don't know if this is more. This makes it a, a '90s thing, but like just the the overall atmosphere of it, because it's a very distinct atmosphere. It was filmed in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, mm-hmm. um, for the first six seasons, six seasons yeah. Uh, which give it a very Pacific Northwest vibe, right? You've got yeah. the tall trees everywhere is woods. I well, I just love that one episode where they're supposed to be in a Florida swamp. Oh yeah, and there's pine trees all around in Vancouver. In Vancouver, right? yeah. <laughs> it's like well, and we, right. <laughs> every every time you and I would be watching an episode, and they would say that whatever the location was, like Nashville, Tennessee, and we'd just be like Vancouver. Yeah, <laughs> it's Nashville, Tennessee, and Vancouver. A, eh? you yeah. know, like or like scenes where it's supposed to be in like New York City or yeah. Washington D.C. And again, clearly it's Vancouver. Like yeah. it's it, you know, You're like yikes. <laughs> yeah. So like I just I, everywhere, and and I think that was kind of the charm of it, right? Like yeah. because it's like as a kid you didn't know any better. But Oh, now I as an did. adult, you're like, okay, this literally all looks the same. Yeah. Uh, and not only that, but they would always reuse a lot of the same actors to play different characters. And in fact, we would- Totally did not, yeah. yeah. So I did not catch that shit until much later. I didn't know. I wasn't paying attention because I saw it so out of order that right, I was just yeah. like, what? But like, I, so like there's, I mean, there's several 
actors that like yeah. we, we'll like look it up. We'll be like, all right, wasn't this person on one of the previous episodes? So we look up the cast name member yeah. or whatever, and, and I would he was in like three other. It's different... like I knew it, and, and then yeah. and then I would see even that he would be in future ones that we hadn't seen yet. So I'd be on the yeah. lookout for him at that point. You know what I mean? Like I just yeah. it was so cool. So it filmed in Canada, gave it a very unique vibe. It, you know, they switched to California for the later seasons, I think because David Duchovny was like, I'm out unless we can film closer to home for me. I can, yeah. That was his big thing, right? And they did go back for seasons 10 and 11. They did, yeah. They went back to Vancouver. Um, and it had a good vibe again. I love the, you know yeah. what I mean? So I, it, I think it paid off. Uh, and I, I, just, I don't know. Like, people talk about how, like, it peaked with seasons five and six in the first movie. I tend to agree because after that, once they got to California, it was it didn't feel the same to me. The, I yeah, I will say the it, I think yeah the vibe change, um, and then also you know I I think David was kind of getting tired and bored with it himself. Yeah, and I well, he was only did, initially contracted for five seasons. Yeah, and I think it did translate a little bit um, on screen, yeah. you know, towards the end, and then you know. I think when he was gone, that was, it was, you know, it was hard on the fans, you know, and things like the ones, especially the shippers. Right. Um, But I do think that like when he came back, like for the series, the original series finale, I think he just seemed more refreshed or something. Yeah. Because he took a break. Um, Yeah. And I feel like I really, that's, I do like this, the original series finale because I feel like he was like. Yeah. He was back. Well, and let's talk about Mulder for a second because I feel like. And I think David Duchovny would get a lot of shit for this back in the day. Like, he wasn't a super... I mean, there were moments, but for the most part, he was pretty even-keeled in his delivery of lines. Like, Mm -hmm. he didn't really have a lot of range. At least that's how it seemed, right? And so, but... I think you 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 appreciate you learn to appreciate just how much range he did have in those earlier seasons when he really seems like he's phoning it in later. We're like, oh, okay, this is really him not necessarily giving as much of a shit as yeah. he did in those yeah. first few seasons. Uh, uh, yeah, because once you notice that, it's just it's it is because I I was noticing like even with when he was still in this the uh, you know the later seasons, it was hard for me to get through some of those episodes with you. I'm not gonna lie, like yeah. I, I felt like we we had to finish them just to finish the show, but like going through the motions, I was not into it as much. Well, yeah, and that's the thing you could tell he was as well and that's yeah. when you know he just he needed to, and and that's that's fair you know like he needed to step away he wasn't feeling it anymore and you yeah. know whatever man you know and he went on to do other things to to pay the bills you know or right. whatever yeah <laughs> so, so let's let's go through some of the characters like some of the recurring and main yeah, characters yeah, yeah. i just want to you know we'll get our thoughts on them so obviously you know you've got Mulder and scully we've and you know, and we're going to talk more about Scully in a second here with you know what's called the Scully effect, yes. very very big thing. Um, but I want to kind of go through some of these other characters that you know I think the show wouldn't have been what it was without them. That's right. Fair, yeah. So you've got Mulder and Scully at the forefront, FBI investigators investigating the paranormal, uh, essentially kind of the black sheep of the FBI. Mm-hmm. No one takes them seriously, but they're, they're in a basement. They're yeah. in a basement office that no one wants to go to, and yet they're going out there and they're seeing some pretty spooky shit. Uh, well, and I'm sorry, just before yeah. I, I did want to say this as well. Um, the paranormal, what I appreciated too, is it was, um, it, it did all of it. Like it, it wasn't, wasn't just, just aliens. aliens. It was, they, you know, go paranormal as in like ghosts and demons and, um, anything that was like not like anything that was slightly weird was covered versus like, supernatural going back to that real real quick supernatural is specific to like demonology and like it it's that vein of paranormal activity right um you know fringe is more it's fringe science so it's supposed to be grounded in some more some kind of science some kind of science but like on the the quote on the fringe. Unquote, fringe yeah yeah um so yeah just just to say they Whereas, would, like if it was weird in any regard like yeah. That was dumped on Mulder and Scully's desk. Exactly. Yeah. It was. It was an X file. Yes. You know, so if you can't explain it, give it to them, and they'll yes. they'll do it. You know. Yes. But you couldn't have their success without again their supporting cast. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you want to talk about first? You want to talk about the FBI supporting cast? Or you want to talk about like the lone gunman? Let's go lone gunman. Okay. So the lone gunman were uh, friends of Mulder's, which you find out in the show, and you find out how they meet and all that stuff. Uh, they were these three essentially like uber conspiracy theorists that yes. form a magazine called the lone gunman uh based off of the whole kennedy assassination yep. thing which funnily enough again you know is actually featured in the show they talk about the kennedy assassination mm-hmm. and so 
you've got these three. You got Frohickey, you got um, Byers, Byers, and, and Langley. Langley. There it is. See, so you know, yeah. and and they're just these three kind of quirky dudes that help out Mulder and Scully. I think. I mean, I, I don't know if there's like a quota for them per every season, but they're in at least a handful of episodes every season. Yeah, where they're you know, it's it could be mythology related. It could just be a standalone episode, yes. but they they bring them in like, hey, we need your help with this th- one thing, and usually it's something where they got to hack into some kind of computer mainframe because that they're like seen as like these techie guys, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then they help them with with you know solving whatever the problem is and then you know they they go back to do their own thing uh to the point where actually they were so popular they actually did end up getting their own Get show the yeah. in the early 2000s the lone gunman now did you ever watch that show when it was on or no unfortunately no okay. i did not know i i it's awful to so say you still never seen an episode i still have not seen an episode i'm okay. an awful fan because i did love them they were very very cute yeah lovable you know guys just kind of goofy goony you know, failure to launch kind of dudes, you know, I just, you envision them like living in their mom's or hanging out in one of their parents' basements or something, you know, right. just like yeah, very goofy little dudes. Perving on Scully. Perving yeah. on Scully all the damn time, <laughs> especially, um, um, Oh my gosh, Frohickey. Frohickey was yeah. was the the one that was the most, um, you know. Yeah. But when push comes to shove, they were always there, especially surrounding like the, um, the William conspiracy and all of that. Like, um, you know, they, um, protected, you know, um, Scully and the baby. Even when Mulder was gone, there was an episode, you know, like yeah. so they were just very like. Very loyal to them, right? Um, and, and would not let anything, you know. They, they. I mean, they sacrificed themselves in that one episode to yeah. prevent harm from befalling, you know, other people. So they were just very, very lovable characters. Yes, absolutely. But they were goofy. And again, they started off as just these kind of weird side characters, you know. And then, but again, they just they were cool enough and more popular enough to say, "All right, well, let's bring them back again. We could probably figure them out into this into the whole plot line or whatever." Yeah. So they did. Um, but then on the FBI side, you've got, I mean, as far as supporting, you know, you know, characters, I mean, you got to go with like Walter Skinner as yes. being the main, you know, so Walter Skinner is the assistant director, uh, of the FBI and he's essentially the boss of Mulder and Scully. Now at mm-hmm. first, when you meet him, you're not sure how you feel about him. At least I know I wasn't. No. Yeah. He, it's very sketchy. Like, is he for them? Is he against them? Um, you know, he's kind of, he has to kind of play both sides to survive, you know, so it does take you a long time to figure out where his loyalties lie. And sometimes throughout you question it a couple of different times to be like, wait a minute, that was strange. But again, it's like, did he, you know, do that out of necessity to save his own ass, you know? Yeah. All I have to say about him, though, is, like, boss of the damn year. Like, I have worked for some amazing people in my life. I don't think any of them would have saved my ass or dragged my ass out of jail or, That's like, fair. you know, like, yeah. half the shit <laughs> that he would show up and do to help them out. Like, I was there, you yeah. know. So Walter Skinner, you get boss of the year or world's greatest boss. World's should, greatest boss. You need the mug. There it is. Um, because yeah, he was always yeah, you know, putting his neck out there and trying to like he's like, oh, and they did not, especially Mulder, did not make his life easy in no. any yeah. regard. They were like, Okay, thanks, bye. Like they would just like go and do their own thing. And yeah. then he's like, Seriously, dude, like I literally just pulled your fat out of the fire. What the fuck? Right. You know? Well, and and cause Anna, I remember watching like the earlier seasons and I was like, what is he? I don't like this guy. And you're like, trust me, he he gets better. Yes, and he and does. when when you first watch him, I, I was like, I can't imagine him getting better because he just seems like a total like terrible person right like he's got to be either in on it or he's just a hard ass there's a character they introduce in one of the later seasons um uh director kirsch who is just literally like a, just not a terrible human being but oh he pretty much is he's he redeems a- himself in the series the original series finale but no i i just have to say thank you thank you thank you shonda rhymes for picking up and making james pickens jr an amazingly decent human being in uh, as Richard Dr. Richard Weber in Grey's Anatomy yes. because I loathe this man entirely and it's ridiculous because he's an actor like he's not actually an but assistant very... director but he was such a 
yeah. shit bag in the show yeah. that like when I saw him as doctor, it actually took me a second. So I think it was a smart move on his part for like moving into that role because it took me a second. I was like, ew, ugh, yeah. I don't want to watch him. Right. Ugh. And you know, his character is very, very like sweet and you know, anyway. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> but my, my point being that, you know, that's what I thought Skinner was at first. Cause yes. like, oh, this guy's just, he's, you know, he's not, uh, he's, he's not, you know, cause you know that Mulder and Skelly are onto all these things and like they're trying to do good or whatever. And, and he just doesn't, he doesn't believe him. He's like, he's, he's making their lives you know, worse their jobs harder when in fact, you know, he's not. But just, you just refer to him as he's like their daddy. Oh my I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna call him I'm not gonna call him their daddy. But uh that's how you know like when when they bring in Kirsch later on, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I thought Skinner was. And so I was hoping Douchebag, yeah. I was hoping that Kirsch would come around as well. And he really he doesn't. Like you say he has a redemption in the last episode. He doesn't. Sort of yes, yes. In the series because he helps him break out of jail. Yeah, but for what motive? What purpose? Like, what were what were his yeah, ulterior motives? You know what I mean? Like, because he finally realized that, like, he had gone so far down the rabbit hole of the conspiracy himself, and he something clicked in him that he was like, "Oh shit!" Like, I'm I'm going to allow this an innocent man. It's like his conscience kicked in. It's like I'm going to allow this innocent man to die, and like he he basically was pulling the trigger. Yeah, but I, to murder this guy, and I don't think it set well on his conscience, and so he came and helped them bust him out of of jail. I still didn't like him afterwards, though. Whereas, like, no, when Skinner started doing good. I mean, maybe because I didn't needed, have. It. I mean, he needed a little bit more. Like, yeah, no, that's not going to erase the years of like bullshit. But I like, guess. that's a start, you know. Like, that's fair. I'm gonna, you know, like, oh my bad. Yeah, that's fair. My okay. bad. I'm gonna prevent you from dying. Like, I feel like that's. I mean, at least that's you got to start somewhere. Yeah. You know? yeah. Okay. So, I mean, are you, there's a few other like minor characters, yeah. kind of supporting characters from the FBI. I mean, well, and let's well, well, you have to talk about. Let's just say, let's talk about Dog and Reyes because yeah. I feel like you have to, you know, give them their due as well. Um, because so basically, and again, if you watch the show, you know this, but in the later seasons, after David Duchovny's like, I'm out. Uh, they essentially had to find a new David Duchovny, and so they brought in uh, famed Terminator Two actor Robert Patrick as uh, John Doggett, a hard-nosed former New York City cop turned FBI Slash, agent. I think he was a, ex, supposed to be an ex-Marine or, or yeah, just retired. Yeah, a, by the books, hard-nosed, yeah. like, you know, didn't buy into all the paranormal stuff that Mulder and mm -hmm. Scully were into. And he was essentially tasked with partnering with Scully, uh, A, to find Mulder, because to, to, Mulder had been, you know, abducted, uh, but also to take over, you know, the X-Files. And, you know, all of a sudden, because up until then you had this dynamic where Mulder was the believer who you know everything fantastical is like well that that's it's I believe in the paranormal and Scully was always the skeptical one like no 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 mm -hmm, there's, mm -hmm. there's got to be a scientific explanation here where now all of a sudden you've got Doggett who uh, is you know he's playing the role of like well this can't be real no that's yeah. ridiculous I've seen some you know and so but but with that you now have Scully who is almost in the Mulder role of being having to be the believer going well I've seen some shit right yeah. so uh and then eventually Doggett does, you know, kind of see that as well. And he's obviously all in, bought in on it as well. But I feel like once that happens, I don't know, part of me is like, I feel like it takes away from some, that, that classic dynamic. Because I feel like that's also yeah. part of the dynamic. And, and I can't speak for Bones or for like Supernatural, but I feel like, you know, these duos have to have the skeptic and then you have to have the one who's all bought into it. Is that yes. true with some of the, like Bones and whatnot as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it, that's part of it. And so once you lose that, when Doggett kind of gets bought in, you lose that dynamic between the two. And not only that, then you bring in another agent to almost replace Scully. Scully doesn't leave the show, but she definitely takes a reduced well, role. Well, yeah. Oh, my gosh. They castrated her. I, I was not a, a huge fan of that as far as like yeah. they just stuck her. You know, as a desk jockey, basically, you know, well, she was a teacher at the at Quantico or whatever. Right. But that's all she was doing. They stuffed her, you know, in a back closet so they didn't have to look at her because she was a sad, sad sack because, you know, Mulder's gone and she was, you know, it's like depressing. Yeah. So, um, so they bring so, in another agent, Monica Reyes, mm -hmm. who, again... I didn't watch a show back then, but from what I've read, like it was not well received. Like people were not fans of Monica Reyes kind of essentially taking over as the second partner on the yeah. X Files. What were your thoughts? I mean, um, like now or back then, like I mean, how do you feel about Monica Reyes? I'm not as against it now as I was back then. I was kind of like, what the hell? I didn't like how she was like and and the reason that they said, because 
you know, people have, like, why did you do that? Is because they didn't want to have, like, an antagonist against Scully. They wanted somebody who would, like, be a partner to her and not be just as skeptical because they figured that would just be, you know, an antagonistic type thing. But yeah. um, so they picked her. Um, and wanted her to be kind of more metaphysical or or whatever, so that it was not going to cross with Scully's like hard and fast scientific, you know, approach yeah. and stuff like that. Um, because even though she started to believe in stuff, uh, she still tried to approach everything with you know science and and a basis in that and you know right. et cetera. Versus you know Monica Race was more like she would just like look at crystals or you know like that's how she was kind more of, like Mulder was. But I'd even, say weirder. But weirder, yes. Like, yeah. she was, like, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Now, and I feel like I, that, it annoyed me for at the time because I was, like, she was acting like, I felt like she acted kind of like a bimbo. And, I mean, it's the role. Like, it wasn't necessarily her acting or whatever. Because sure. I've seen her in other things, you know. I think it was just the way the role was written. Right. And she just worked with what she had, you know. Um my biggest flaw with her was the horrible Spanish accent. She had a Spanish accent? Or, or not Spanish, or like her accent is when she spoke Spanish. Oh, she spoke Spanish. she was supposed to be uh, from Mexico or, or something heritage. like that. Yeah, because she, yeah, she's her, you know, Reyes, and so she's supposed to be from, she's supposed to speak like fluent Spanish. And right. so like those, there's those episodes that take place and I'm like, I am not fluent in Spanish by any means. And when she does launch into her spanish i'm like huh? right huh? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's awful it's, yeah so um so that's my biggest flaw with with her really i i you know she should have maybe brushed i don't know whatever anyway yeah no nothing against her but uh no i wasn't <laughs> i wasn't a huge huge fan no. yeah Okay. No, that's fair. I mean, and so you know, yeah, that's And i also felt that cuz they were trying to push and that's where I was like, all right, y'all, like Mulder and Scully have something like you, they were trying to push Doggett and Ray. Oh, they together. were trying to and force that like, romance. Um, and it was not working. No, that yeah. didn't like opposites attract, but to a point like she like I said, she's literally like tarot card reading, crystal reading. He's like, you know, USMC Semper Fi just very like well i don't don't know i just felt like their characters were very very like that didn't make any sense that they were romantically linked i more so just didn't feel that there was chemistry between that that too but again i just felt like it was just so like they were so so different that i was like no maybe i don't know i don't think so now that being said i do want to praise uh robert patrick and what was the actress name for annabeth gish annabeth gish i mean because i think they're both fantastic performers like yeah i mean like like I said, there I've seen them in you know, especially you know Annabeth. I I thought honestly Robert did an amazing. I think he did better than Annabeth Gish. I'm hundred percent. Yeah. Um, just his because he was able to come in in that night. He had huge. Like I would have if I were an actor, I'd have been freaking scared if I were him. He had huge shoes to fill because David Duchovny. And Scully or and, and Jillian Anderson had been together for seven freaking seasons. Yes. Seven seasons. That ship or ship had sailed, if you will, you know, where like everybody was all about that. Right. The series or season finale of seven, he's abducted, gone. Nobody knows where the hell he is or if he's ever coming back. And then this man has to come in and like fill that role. And yeah. Like, like I said, I'd have been quaking in my boots if if I was the actor taking that role like if i were him right um and i think he did it with grace and and he did a great job where he didn't you know and and the writing too obviously you know assisted in that if it was written differently it might not have come across as well but i think he did a superb job of just kind of keeping it um like he really really cared for her and about her and really did genuinely want to find the the truth and find Mulder and and he wanted to do the best job he possibly could um but it also kept it very like it wasn't like she had moved on to him you know like they didn't sure, try yeah. to like make that like that that a thing um which no. would have been like creepy and awkward no, and weird yeah. um so i appreciate that but he was like always just so gentlemanly like i loved yeah well i would like always mention it to you like during that season i was like man like he is a good freaking dude like yeah. he would just come in like and save the day 
and he may um, not know what's going on. Yeah, but he it had didn't no matter. idea, but he had a he had a gun and he was not afraid to use it. That's kind right. of deal. Yeah, and he was gonna shoot questions or shoot now and ask questions later, basically. Yeah. Um, and the number of times he like did save her in a situation, I so I think he did a fantastic job, and it pisses me off. I don't know what happened there or whatever, but they didn't even bother to like, even if they couldn't have gotten him for seasons ten and eleven, they did not reference him. They did right. not mention him at all they pretended he did not ever exist and i feel like that was just because he did a great job yeah considering what he had to work with i think he did an amazing job absolutely 100 percent agree um so yeah that's my two cents on him absolutely so there's there's our kind of our, our our core protagonists of of the group now let's talk about some of the kind of more morally gray villains. characters no we're getting to villains but oh. i feel like there's an in-between there's some characters oh, that yeah. kind of go back and forth between are they good are they bad you don't really know uh so let's talk about some of those right let's start let's talk about you know from the first season you know you have uh essentially Mulder's informant that helps him in his his journey to uncover the truth uh i we, they tell you his name later I forgot it, but uh, in Deep the first throat. season, he is known as, like you said, yeah, Deep Throat. Uh, I forget the actor's name. Uh, again, did a fantastic job. So, so Deep Throat was part of this whole group of of people, essentially, called the Syndicate. And they, I mean, I think the ultimate goal, which became very unclear later on, but like was to create... They did, yeah, they did muddle that a little bit. Yeah. But anyway. Anyway, so I, I, I'm not, yeah. Essentially, their goal at one point was to create like super soldiers, but before then well, it no, was... Well, no, basically, basically what the syndicate was trying to do is the, the aliens inevitably were coming to colonize our planet. That was made clear, um, you know, when they landed. And so the syndicate was there to be like, to kind of like fake play nice with them and basically say yeah sure you can fucking take over our planet just right. make sure we're you know we're okay um you know like if we do this for you if, like if we scratch your back you scratch our back and both groups i mean obviously that that would make sense we're very skeptical of each other um and so you come to find out later the aliens had no intention of ever keeping them you know a lot they were going to take over you know they had plans on doing that no matter what. Yeah. And then the syndicate had plans of like, they were racing against the clock to synthesize a vaccine. Yeah. Against the alien virus that would, you know, take over whatever. So that was there. They were going to set up and be, you know, let everybody die. They would be the shadow government, if you will. So they would be, you know, the humans that would, you know, take over after, you know, basically the apocalypse. Um, They would be the, the ones left standing. Right. So yep. that was them. Okay. And so Deep Throat was a guy who I guess, you know, you're you're led to believe that, well, maybe he just he feels really bad for what they've done and so he wants Mulder to find out the truth, but needs to do it in a way where he's not gonna come back and bite him in the ass, essentially, is what his goal was. Yeah. Now unfortunately that doesn't happen because he is found out and you know, he is Well yeah, and the same thing like Mulder's dad also was yeah. part of the syndicate. Well, we come to find out he's not his actual dad. But anyway, Mulder's dad um, was part of it, and he... Well, technically his real dad was also part of the syndicate. Yes, but the um, the one that you're led to believe is his actual, like, biological dad from the beginning... Sure. ...was in, um, you know, as well, and he was killed because he started... He felt so bad about it. He was about to tell Mulder everything. Yep. And then he got offed, you know, so... I think, yeah, the syndicate was, there were some evil people, and we'll talk about the most evilest of them, but um, but there were some that were like kind of wavery, waffly. They were like, ooh, yeah, I don't, ooh, I don't that doesn't set well with me like that. does right. not feel right. Um, but a lot of them, again, if they felt that way, they were, they were bumped off. They were swiftly, taken care of. swiftly taken care of. Swiftly taken care of, exactly. So yeah. Deep Throat being among them. Now, to replace Deep Throat, Mulder still needed to have an informant, right? Because that was kind of part of that whole narrative, too, is you had the guy on the inside that would give him tiny clues to get him, but not enough to where it gives it all away. Yeah. So, to replace him, you have another mysterious guy uh, called X, mm -hmm. who was played by actor Stephen Williams, who, fantastic actor, I know yes, him from yes. several movies, uh, including Friday the 13th Part 9, Jason Goes to Hell. Uh, that's actually what I first saw him in. So when I saw him in the show, I was like, oh shit, that's Creighton Duke from Jason Goes to Hell. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, no, he's, so anyway, um, another, again, kind of mysterious, I'd say even more mysterious. I think it was, yeah, like his, um, 
there's something about his facial features are very sharp. Yes. Um, and his eyes very are intense. Very like he has. Yeah, it's cr- like if if this man stared me down, I'd be I'd be a little I'd wet myself a little bit. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um. So he did an amazing job just with that like persona of being like a creepy like will you will you kill me? Are you actually trying to help me? Like what the fuck's going on? Kind of dude. Like right. yeah. 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 So he was, again, he was, I'd say, even more morally gray than Deep Throat was. Deep Throat yes. at least felt like a good nature, like good intentioned, you know, well intentioned guy trying to help do the right thing. Whereas X was like, he's like, straight up tells him, was like, I don't like you. I don't know you. I'm only doing this because the guy before you, like. Well, because I... it also, like, would, f- he would do things that furthered his interests. Right. It was less about trying to help Mulder out, more like. More like helping himself exactly. out. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, you don't really ever find out specifically what his interests are, but because much like Deep Throat, he is killed he at gets, the end of yeah. season two. Uh, taken out. Um, yeah, and he comes back like later, but in flashbacks and as a, well, as and a also weird as like a ghost, a ghost, was, which I, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, kind of stupid. But anyway, uh, so there's there's again another morally great character, and then there's one more morally great character who I guess would lean more toward evil. So it would be a good segue into the last set of characters I want to talk about. But um, uh, Marina Cova Rubius. Oh yes, played by yes. uh. The girl, uh, Lori, Lori Holden, I believe is her name, or Lauren Holden, Lori Holden. Uh, I know her from The Walking Dead. She's in The Walking Dead oh, seasons right. one through three. Oh, so I that's, forgot about that. That's what I mean, I've seen her on other stuff too. But anyway, yeah. so she plays a uh, basically Mulder's third informant. She works, I believe, in like the, the government, Nations. like the United Nations. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. And so she, you know, starts off as you know what appears to be a very helpful resource, helps point him in the right direction. Come to find out, she is in fact in on it with the syndicate. And yes. now she was 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 she the whole time, or was she turned? Like... I think she got bought out. I think that was the implication. Okay, is that she was more so money and power hungry, and so yeah. somebody just gave her a higher offer, dollar bill offer, and she took that. Basically, yeah. I think that's what the what they were trying to imply or come across is that her her um, loyalty was very easily bought. Sure, and yeah, sold. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, the syndicate became the highest bidder. And so she was like, fuck it, I'm in. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What were your thoughts on Marina Covarubias? I think she did a great job. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, cause you've got her, she's helping this, that, the other. Um, and then she basically screws, you know, screws them a couple times, several times. Um, and then turns out like she got double crossed by her own people and then she became a um she double double crossed basically yeah there's yeah, a lot of shit <laughs> happening um but she became their test subject they injected her with a virus to right. try to synthesize this this vaccine um but then again in season nine at the series finale she did come around and she did try to testify on behalf of Mulder to, to get do him. the right yeah yeah so like she just waffles back and forth back and forth yeah and yeah um, she got and she got her. She got her come up and you know because they did. They caught her and injected her and yeah. You know she survived somehow. They didn't kill her character off for whatever reason. I'm not quite sure why because they could have very easily. Now I forget. Did she her. come back in the later seasons, like eleven and, or ten? And no, 11? no, no, okay. no. We don't see her in the reboot or anything. No, but like she doesn't that. die that we know of on screen. That we know that's of, right. yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. But they so, don't reference her at all. Okay, so. yeah, yeah, that's right. We don't know where she's at. Yeah. So, but again, I think she's another ideal, a perfect example of like a morally great character. That's so, yeah, you know, because again, she's she has like legitimately helped them. Yeah. But then she has also like screwed them over massively. Yes. You know, I would agree, hundred um, percent. So. So now let's talk about you know. The you know, we've covered the the good, we've covered the morally gray. Let's let's get into the evil characters, yes. right? So let's talk about first because there's a couple. Uh, let's talk about our buddy Alex Krychek. Mm. Um, <laughs> Nicholas Lee. Nicholas Lee is the actor, great actor. Uh, what are your thoughts on? Actually, I know your thoughts on Krychek. But please share them with our listening audience here. Just a bag <laughs> of dicks. No, um, and again, he's another one. Like I feel so bad. Um, like James Pickens Jr. Um, Nicholas Lee in my mind is literally just a piece of shit. Um, and he's probably like a super nice guy. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, like I know he's friends with David Duchovny, like in real life, like they're good buddies. Um, and so I just feel really bad because I don't know what I would do if I saw him in the street. I'd be like, you piece of shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd yeah. be like, okay. Um, so anyway, I feel bad because yeah, Alex Krychek. Um, okay, so he's one that was a recycled character, yep. interestingly enough. So he was in 
the first uh, recycled actor, like he played multiple actor. characters. That's what, but 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 this was interesting. So he was in the episode Gender Bender. Yes. Um. And and um. Which was actually that was just an interesting, you know, especially in the times. That that's something. If we ever do like s- episodes, like oh, like specific, episodes you know what I mean, analysis. like that one, yeah. just for that. Anyway, that's my side tangent. Because that was a very interesting <laughs> episode for the times. But anyway, yes. he was in. It was a season one episode, um, as as I recall, Gender Bender, and apparently they loved him. The producers, the directors, Chris Carter, everybody was like, "Holy shit!" And they basically like at that point like cast him for Alex Krychek. Yeah. So that was one where I was like, "Wait, I did see you because it wasn't that long after they introduced Alex Krychek's character and I was like, "You were like in a Monster of the Week episode." And so yeah, I looked it up and I was like, "Oh yeah." Okay. Yeah. But they loved him so much in his his delivery of um the gender bender episode. Um and so he's Alex Krychek who at first you think um it's it's after so everybody gets we joked everybody either gets like abducted or is on life support at some point right in the x-files so he's introduced after scully's abduct abduction yep um and he's basically kind of like dog it was there to help you know whatever um scully find Mulder. like alex krychek was tasked with helping Mulder find scully right. and you know yada yada so he at first you're like okay he's just this like greenhorn like he seems very eager and like he's a new newbie and like you know whatever um and then very 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 quickly you realize that he's there to basically sabotage everything yeah um sabotage finding scully's sabotage you know molder and the x files and he's there to push he's basically kind of the the wild card like or the i'm sorry the, the hitman for the syndicate like they task him with like taking out people and things that are in the way of the right. syndicate pushing their agenda and so, yes, and he literally just time and time again just fucks them over. And so at when he dies, um, Walter Skinner puts a bullet between his eyeballs. And that to me is like, that's the best episode ever. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> you're like, die, bitch, die. Right. Um, but yeah. And I feel terrible because like I said, probably in real life, he's a very nice man. Yes. <laughs> I have um, no idea. <laughs> yeah. No, he's an interesting one because yeah, like he's, you know, he's introduced first as a, like a temporary, you know, either a permanent or temporary, you don't really know, like replacement for Scully. Yeah, just a... And everyone's like, what the hell is this guy? And then very quickly, they... Oh yeah, it's not long They after. don't drag it out. There's not a big twist. I mean, I, no. you can't really call it a twist because it's in the same episode. You're like, oh shit, okay, he's he's going to screw. He's no bueno. He's yeah. no bueno. Exactly. Uh, but uh, yeah, a very interesting character. And and I do and love... And he's one that is also very kind of like Marita Covarrubias. He's very self-serving as well. Yes. Well, and that's what you could almost say he's like morally gray leaning towards bad whereas Marina Covarrubias was maybe the opposite side. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. This is like where they kind of like... Well, and they wound up getting together at one point too. Funnily like, enough, yeah, <laughs> just, they hook up themselves. Yeah, yeah, the two of them hook up and then they wind up... Yeah, that was, that was kind of funny, but... that is not the romance people wanted to see with Alex Not Crouching. at all, not at all. So sorry <laughs> for him, but he, you know, they at least got... Uh... No, what they, what they really wanted was to see, you know, David Duchovny yeah. and you know, Mulder and Krychek because... Let me tell you what, Mulder by Mulder and Krychek? Yeah, you know, people always joke about how they're like oh. lovers you know what i mean because let me tell you what they have i mean you talk about this the chemistry they're, of Mulder well, and because Scully. they're i think friends in real life right yes that's what i'm saying they played off each other so they well their chemistry great, was fantastic i loved i still quote it you got stupid haircut and he punches that him in the face. one yeah that yeah. one episode where he's got him like cuffed up and he's like he needs the, him to find something yeah as so they're driving around you know whatever and and he just like kind of like freaking boops him on the head with the heel of his hand and he's just like your, your stupid fucking haircut or well he didn't say that f bomb right, but, right. but he's like stupid haircut yeah and and the way the interaction it's like literally like brothers like screwing with each other yeah. it's hilarious yeah and i laugh every time <laughs> yeah. um so i think they did a great job together because again yeah they had natural like they were friends yeah no i i, I agree i think their chemistry was fantastic and it really shined through there so all right uh there are certainly other characters we could talk about but there's only one more character i want to go in depth on here yes. and that is everyone's favorite bad guy everyone who you love to hate now <laughs> it's truly like the most hateable and yet lovely actor Oh, yes. Ever. Uh, we're talking, uh, of course, about... Delightful Canadian. Yes. We're talking about the cigarette-smoking man played by... Uh, 
What is the actor's name? William B. Davis. William B. Davis. Yep, there it is. Thank you. I knew you were going to know that. Oh, yes. So, funnily enough, uh, when he was for he, he was featured in the first episode yep. of The X-Files as unnamed government employee. He was just supposed to be an extra to, to basically add to the mystery and the allure of yeah. the show. He literally didn't have a part written, apparently, no. for him at the time. No, and, you know. Funnily enough, he's Canadian, but you know, in the American dream way, he literally created a job for himself. Like, yes, it was because were... of his presence, and uh, I don't know if it's because he was local; it was easy to get get a hold of to come on set. Right. But like, he literally created a role for himself and became essentially the head of the conspiracy. Mm-hmm. He was the ultimate bad guy. He was so you couldn't kill him. You could not. He wouldn't die. And, he would not die. Yeah, to the point where I think it. Like they allude to him being supernatural or even like the devil, right? Don't they say he's like the devil? I don't think they actually ever outwardly, that was just my interpretation of the fact that like clearly in season uh, nine in the series finale, clearly you see um, these like Apache helicopters come with like rocket launchers on the side. Right. And on the sides and they blow him up. You clearly, they like cut to, you see the flames licking up his face and like the skin peel away to like reveal a skull. Right. And you're like, motherfuckers dead. Yes. You know? Um, and this then all after of a he'd sudden, already been shot and pushed down the shot, stairs. Shot. He and... had been pushed down the stairs, like all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, and he still kept coming back. So like, uh, and then you see him come back again and he's got like, they make it look like he had some skin grafts, you know, like whatever. Right. Um, and so either it's like implying that he has, you know, cause he did inject himself. Like he put like Mulder's brain tissue inside, you know, if you remember when he mm-hmm. was abducted and all that craziness. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's either implying that he has leveraged that technology, um, you know, that, that they had and, and sought after to basically he's become kind of a, like an alien himself where he like regenerates or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, or it's just, um, Chris Carter's just way of, of like representing like the devil, like, you know, evil persists, you know, right. like it's, you can't kill it. Yep. Um, and, and I do, you know, I, this is not the segment I guess for it, but, but I, I do, you know, I noticed throughout the X Files just the the oh my, like the religious overtones oh, that actually happened. Yeah. Um a lot of them um throughout. So that's where I just made that comment, you know, because of the gotcha. religious overtones where I felt like was that his way of representing or his interpretation of like the devil, if you will. Well, and not only that, because again, he's a very manipulative character Mm -hmm. to where like, you're like for like half a second, oh, maybe he's really good intention. And we're going to find out that he actually is the good guy. He's like, maybe he's like the Snape all along. We're like, no, he's, he's, he's pure evil now. And this, I don't understand why I don't, I don't know why. Cause he's evil. Yeah. I don't hate him. No. Like if I were to see him. Yeah. I don't know why. Is maybe because he's just this old man? Yeah. And I just have a hard time just hating somebody who looks like they're my grandpa. Right, right. I don't know. But anyway, he's one and I've seen a lot of interviews that he's done as well and I yeah. think maybe that's why cuz he just is a lovely lovely delightful like It's a Canadian accent. Yeah, you're he's like just, you're Canadian. Like yeah. you're just the nicest freaking human. He has his own William B Davis like school, acting school. Oh yeah. Um he's an avid. He's very into like water skiing apparently oh, and like huh. physical activity. Like that's, you know, he he loves that he has, you know, grandkids that he has referenced and thing like he's just it sounds like a family guy anyway. Right. He just seems like a delightful human. It's hilarious to me that he played such like literally the pinnacle of like the definition of of evil yes. you know absolutely yeah 100 you No, know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head and he's one of the greatest villains of all time right yes. I, hands down uh because not only is he just evil and manipulative he's also as you find out in in you know, midway through the series kind of a badass right he was tasked in the in the, the mid-century the mid-1900s with like taking on these secret projects and like he became this like super badass character that like well, and he's the one that killed kennedy well, that's what i'm saying yeah. well, and that's why i'm saying we would get back to it you find out he is the one responsible for the kennedy assassination for mm-hmm. the death of martin luther king jr yep. uh so many other all things. of the yeah basically yeah it all the crazy the things in human history was him is hi- yeah you know so like he is kind of this is badass and so you know it's you're like man he's and maybe that's why you can't hate him because it's like man he's kind of fucking cool you know what i mean like um killing people's not cool no it's not but as far as like (laughs) just like this his character is presented as like this like this 
this badass, right? That happened to yeah. do evil things because he wanted a paycheck. Because there is even like a scene in one of the episodes where he's almost redeeming himself and is like, you know what? I'm I'm done with this bad stuff. He does, yeah. He's try. He does try a couple. It's only times. once. I feel like it's only once. I Maybe guess. it's a couple times, but where um, he but wants to he be gets a writer, slapped down. Yeah, um, basically. And honestly, that actually kind of that was. I felt like that was very powerful. Um you know, where he was trying to get out of it. He's trying to write, you know, he wants to be a writer and like all of, he's just getting these, this like rejection after rejection after rejection from these publishing companies. Right. And like, it's like literally he snapped, Yeah, you know? And so obviously he's like, gotta be a sociopath, right? Because like the normal, a normal person would be sad. Yes. Sure. But like, they wouldn't be like, well, fuck it. I'm going to go kill presidents. But and, you know, he, well, yeah, he, yeah, he just, he, you know, he accepts. It's like, All right. Well, I guess I'm just destined to be yeah, evil. I'm supposed to be bad. Yeah. Right. And, and he so, just kind of leans into it from there. Yeah. So. Which is, and it's a very, I, I think he's probably one of the best written villains of any TV show because there's so many layers there and they're all evil layers. Don't get me wrong. Oh, but yeah. there's so many layers. Yeah. yeah. So, well, anyway, I wanted to kind of go through, like I said, the, the character kind of an analysis of each of the characters because yeah. they do play a significant role in addition to just, you know, Mulder and Scott. Gully, which again, you know, we've we've I think we've covered them pretty well here. Now, um, before we wrap up here, um, you know, in what is I've decided because we're now we're out over an hour into this episode, uh, oh, yeah. this is going to be part one of our two part X Files episode. Uh, so next time around, we're going to be talking about uh, the movies. We're not going to do that here That's today. So fair. we're going we're going to review the movies next time, and then, uh, yeah, because I feel like those deserve their own full mm-hmm. episode where we talk about the movies. So we're going to wrap up today with something I promised very, you know, at the very beginning of the episode, and that's something that uh, really meant a lot to you, yes, in particular, and and women everywhere. Um, yes. is you know talking about Scully, and more specifically something that has been deemed the Scully effect. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that first. So what is the Scully effect? Yeah, it's uh, well documented. They've done they've done research. Um, on um, just how her character um, in the you know in the nineties spawned just this surge of women going into steam you know science technology engineering etc uh, roles um, and how they were just they hadn't seen um, a woman like that before in television and just how powerful that was that you know drove people or drove women specifically into you know scientific roles um that typically were you know held by men nine out of you know 10 times or whatever right um and so um you know professors you know had started noticing like the shift in kind of the breakdown of gender like within their classes you know on on college campuses you know in in the science fields and right. everything yeah, like yeah. that um, and they were just, you know, again, it, they've done, they've done research on it, but I would say, you know, she definitely, um, inspired me for sure. I always liked science. I was always kind of, I, I would like to think I'm a little more science and math minded, just, you know, whatever. But, um, I wound up taking, um, forensic science classes in college, just like electives. I needed yeah. science electives. So I took though, like I chose that specifically because of the show. Um, I, you know, went on to become, you know, a science teacher uh, for for many years. And um, I still have a very, very big passion for um, science. The abil- I love, um, you know, also her ability to, um, she's self-sufficient. Like, she didn't need Mulder um, to do her thing. Like, she was, she could handle it on her own. Like, and there were a couple of times where he did come and, you know, rescue, like, don't get me wrong. And, you know, whatever. But she was um, self-sufficient. She was logical. She was intelligent. She would stand up when she needed to against the man, if you will. Right. Um, there's an episode where there's like a congressional hearing of sorts. And she's basically just going after, you know, um, basically uh, not accusing them, but saying like, this is, you know, I support our, our, our country and, and what it's, you know, uh, founded on and, and the justice system, but you're not upholding that. Like you're not upholding, right. you know, like she called them out, um, you know, on that. And again, like back then, especially like, you know, women didn't really like, they weren't about to just sit there and like call out a congressional panel of like all old white dudes. Like right. that, that wasn't about to happen, you know, no, but so exactly. you saw that and you were like, holy crap, like 
wow, like she did that. Like she was just this tiny little woman that was like, she would direct, you know, she would go to these crime scenes or go into the autopsy room and you do this, you do that, you know? And it wasn't like in a bitchy way. Like it was like, she, she knew what she was doing. She took control of the situation and she was like firm, but like, like, let's do this, but this is how it needs to be done kind of deal. Like she wasn't just like, you know, a bitch about it. Um, and so all of that, like, you know, that, that also drove law enforcement, you know, women into into law enforcement yeah. because she was just such a powerful, you know, um, force. Yeah. Um, and didn't, like I said, didn't need Mulder. Yeah. Um, well, not only, I mean, you know, not only did you become a science teacher, but like, I just, because I, you, you told me stories, like you, you dyed your hair red. Because... Oh, yeah. No, I was obsessed. Yeah. She was one where I was like, am I? straight no <laughs> i'm not gonna lie yeah like i'm not gonna lie like i i She's yeah, what I, 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 yeah. I might have i might have tried it out if jillian knocked on my door i'd be like ah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know um uh, but yeah no she was like gorgeous like yeah. just beautiful absolutely gorgeous i dyed my i did dye my hair red i did the the you know, well, we call it the Karen now, which is a shame. The straight haircut. But the, the little, like, she had the short, like, the short bob, kind of layered bob thing going on later on in seasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know? Um, and she also, I mean, hell, she was, for, for the beginning of season nine, she was, like, a mom, and she was, like, working, you know, because she had William, and she was, like, teaching, and she was also solving, like, you know, she, like, literally did it all. Yeah. Um. And got it all done at no matter what, you know? Right. Um, so I I appreciated that. I, I thought, you know, and I think that's amazing that that had that effect. I think that's, I mean, and it just shows you representation matters. Like yeah, it absolutely. really, really, I think that was the first time um, that that really showed, you know? And yeah. so not just women, but like, you know, going forward. Um, Anyone underrepresented. Exactly. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that it was necessarily like that the, it spawned it, but I think, you know, people, you know, started to see, oh, well, you know, maybe we need to look into other, other things, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, because that's, that is, that is huge. If you see somebody that, that looks like you or is you or whatever, you know, that inspires you. Yeah. I, I mean, would you, so let me ask you this. Would you say that she was one of your biggest TV role models, like growing up, like, ever i mean yeah i mean so mine uh, mine were interestingly enough uh her velma from scooby-doo okay uh um, i did not know that by the way oh yeah she was i i thought velma was like everyone was like oh daphne and i was like fuck daphne she's a moron <laughs> velma's where it's at like she's an idiot yeah um and let's see penny from uh inspector gadget okay yep she was amazing um, and so really those were kind of like my, my top three those are your role Lurie's models. Yeah. Very studious, very like, you know, Penny always had, like, I thought it's, it's funny now that I have, I have her watch. I've got a smart watch, you That's know? Right. Yeah, yeah. Cause that was on the show. She would always talk into her watch and she would call her dog. Now I haven't figured out how my dog's dumb as shit. So I haven't figured <laughs> out how to tap into my dog's brain with that. That's so, right. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Google call me when you figure that out because he's really <laughs> stupid. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so I would say those are my Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, and you're you're so right though, because like I said, Scully is is truly like one of the most influent and, and I just, you know, I growing up I didn't know it because again, I didn't watch the I show. I didn't either, yeah. I mean... But like now going back and watching it through, like, yeah, I can totally see that. And and I feel like it wouldn't have worked. Like it wasn't just the character Scully, it was Julian Anderson. As yeah. well, like it, it, I don't think it would have worked nearly as well with another actress playing Scully. Well, and she also, Jillian Anderson, like in in real life, is also very, very like um, pro. Like I'm not saying that she's necessarily like a, a full blown feminist or anything like that, but she's very like supportive of women yeah. in the field of like acting, directing, yeah. you know, all of that equality things like that. So you know, she also, you know, on her own you know, promoted that kind of stuff outside of, of the show. But I think she did a, an amazing job just yeah, really representing and, and showing that like, yeah, we, we are just as valuable in law enforcement, in science, in right. these typically or, or traditionally hard fields that were male dominated. 
we're just as good and we we can do just as much as the next guy you right. know exactly yeah no and, and i think you, i think you hit the nail on the head is that it, it shows that like yeah man she's she happens to be a woman but she's also a badass but she's also you know very feminine you know what i mean mm-hmm. she wasn't like a butch whatever yeah. like she well, was, and like i said she was i mean she was a mom you know she's yeah. taking care of, she, of her kid she exactly. was very protective of him oh and by the way she's a doctor right yeah and I she's mean, a freaking doctor like yeah like yeah you know come on molder i mean like, now listen i will say like buy if, her I had, some flowers. if i had to take a shot for every time she told us she was a medical doctor on that show i'd be that no that's true or uh, molder it's me yeah, well, sure, yeah. I would have been in, like, my liver would have failed. Right. My liver would have fully failed. <laughs> oh, man, good stuff. All right, well, listen, let's wrap up what, again, I was not planning this, but I've decided since we've just, we've covered so much and there's so much more I want to talk about with this That's show. Fair. So let's So uh, let's wrap up here. And before we do, I want to share a few listener thoughts. And by the way, if you want to share your thoughts about future episodes uh, or, you know, even previous episodes, make sure, uh, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram at generation underscore S underscore podcast and shoot us a message. Uh, so Kenny from upstate New York writes in, uh, you know, this was a little embarrassing, but I was terrified of the X Files theme music when I was a kid. Uh, it legit gave me panic attacks to hear those notes. And by the way, we didn't even really talk about the theme song, right? I, I feel like that's one thing. Like when we go back to talking about the vibes of the show, my God, what a great theme song, yes. right? Like, and I know they changed it in, in for some of the later seasons, and it was a little different. But like that classic. Yeah. Oh, and it was. What's what is it about that song that's so scary? Like, what can you can you pin it down? Oh, it's probably like the the composition of like the notes and the key that it was in made it kind of. I mean, I'm not like a music major by any right. means. So but no, there's I'm, something I'm about the notes. Words. Yeah, was it? In a but minor it was the key combination. And... Yeah, and the and the key, um, and the echo, um. Yeah. And it was just like a very and the instruments were kind of unnerving. It was like a whistly sounding, yeah, almost yeah, ghost like, yeah, yeah. So... I think that's what it was. And then the imagery on screen during the intro was pretty didn't weird. help, yeah, yeah. So okay, so anyway, so I can't believe we didn't shout out the sh- the, the 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 theme song. Cover cover that. Mark, Iconic. Mark Snow being the uh, that's right, yeah, Mark Snow, co- composer, very of famous all the, composer. He, of he's the done a bunch of, stuff, of yeah. the score, not the store. Yes, the score. Well, yeah, because even like during the episodes, the actual like um, score underneath the you know were, was great. I thought it. Was yeah, great. they didn't use a lot of shows. And again, I know you want to wrap up. Sorry, but a lot of shows would <laughs> use like like music tracks of like actual like music that's out there. Sure, yeah, and stuff like they never really incorporated. It was all, orchestral. It was yeah. all like. Mark Snow, like in his freaking sound lab, I guess, you know, just putting shit together. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's what it is. And and it just, you know, and, and not only that, okay, sorry, you're right. I know I'm supposed to be wrapping this up, but there's one other thing I want to share is what what one thing I really love and, and why I feel like X Files holds up very well now to rewatch it is that it was filmed like so well. Like it felt like you're watching movies every single week, right? Like yes. it, they were filmed in a way that made it feel big. And it was a TV budget. I mean, they didn't yeah, do no. anything uh you know, it was no, a- because we've tried because, you know, I've tried rewatching other shows from that time period and they just they don't look as good. Mm-hmm. They, don't, they don't sound as you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just, it's not as it's not as good. So anyway, I just had to shout that out. The cinematography in X-Files also top notch. Uh, one more listener thought here. Then we will wrap up Tanya in Atlanta. I've watched every episode of X-Files. Truly one of my favorite shows of all time. I absolutely love the show. And at the time, I had a wish of being an FBI agent when I got older. See, perfect example of the mm-hmm. Scully effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that never happened. But I was so inspired by Agent Scully and... I had a crush on Agent Mulder. So oh, who didn't? He who was, didn't? He was hot. What a fox, no pun intended. Right? Am I right? No, he was freaking hot. <laughs> <laughs> no, that didn't shock me. I was like, yeah, he's hot. But like, yeah, I was like, hey, Jillian, like, call me. No. Oh, my God. Jeez. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, then let's wrap this up because next week we've got a brand new part two episode where we will be covering the movies. And we'll talk about the reboot a little bit as well. I know that was technically not part of our childhood, but it's part of the show. So let's let's talk about that as well. And then maybe we'll talk about some of the video games or the the spinoff, the books, anything like that, too. Any other thoughts there? So, all right, uh, all right guys, that's going to wrap it up for us. Make sure if you are enjoying this series, you, you know, uh, 
Tell a friend about it. If you know anyone that grew up in the 90s or, in this case, loves sci-fi, uh, share this episode out with them. Make sure they have a chance to give it a listen as well. And make sure you're following us on all social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Generation S Podcast. And we will be back next week with part two of The X-Files, where we're covering the films, the later seasons, and some other cool stuff along the way. And, uh, Beth, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And uh, I mean it this time in all seriousness. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.